and welcome to GameSack. This time we're looking at our top five favorite arcade to home conversions. Yeah, we are. There was a um, fun episode to do, I thought. Uh, there's a it lot was. of we're still doing it. Well, we are, <laughs> but the games to pick was a fun part. Yeah. Because there was a lot of them out there that could have made the list, but ultimately these are the ones that we picked in. And what we did here is Dave picked his top five, I picked my top five. So that we're, we're not trying to mesh them up into a big top 10 like we did last time. Yeah. So it's going to be a little cleaner this time. Mm -hmm. And Dave has his top fives first. So let's see what you picked. Naturally. Number five, Smash TV on the Super Nintendo. Smash TV is a hugely addictive arcade game. It borrows its theme from the movie The Running Man where you're playing for your life in a game show setting. This was always a favorite game to play with friends as we were waiting to watch a movie at the theater. When it was released for the Super Nintendo as Super Smash TV, I bought it on day one. I would have sold my ass on the street corner to get money to buy this game. Luckily, I didn't have to go that way and I was able to scrounge together enough coin to get it. So if you've never played this, it plays like an ultra-violent Robotron. The arcade game had two joysticks, one to move around and the other to fire. Since there aren't any controllers like that for the home system, you'll have to make do with using the face buttons to fire at your enemies. This is a bit tough, but it works really well. But if you want crappy controls, you should try the Genesis version. You have two options and both of them kind of suck. The first option has you using one controller. The A button shoots the way you're facing, the B button shoots in the opposite direction, and the C button locks your fire. This is doable, but it takes a while to get used to. The second option is actually really cool and it lets you use the directional pad on two controllers. The only problem here is that it's very uncomfortable holding two controllers. So the Super Nintendo version is the best home version based on this alone. I love this game. It's filled with lots of violence, big guns, big bosses, money, VCRs, and toasters. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yes, it even steals a quote from Robocop. It's so satisfying mowing down hordes of drones. Wave after wave keep coming at you and it just feels good taking them all out. Playing this game in single player is tough and it's really hard to get very far that way. Playing two player is where it's at and it makes the game much, much more fun. Just make sure to play the SNES version as it's one hell of a good time. Number 4, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Obviously, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a hugely popular game in the arcade. I spent a fair amount of time and a lot of my parents' money on this game and I loved every minute of it. Konami released a home version on the NES in 1990, just one year before the Super Nintendo launched. I always wondered if it had been out at the time if Konami would have put the game on there instead. We'll never know, I guess. Anyways, the good news is that the game was ported to the NES. Of course, the port is pretty much a lesser version of the arcade game. For the most part, everything is in here, but it just isn't as rich and detailed as the arcade. The graphics are good and detailed for the NES. All four turtles are playable, but you can only play two at a time instead of four like the arcade. The turtles control pretty well, and I have no complaints. I also have no complaints about the music, as it's really enjoyable. Not everything has been compromised from the arcade though. Actually, most of the levels have been lengthened and there is even a new one that wasn't in the arcade which is pretty awesome. I think I like the arcade game and the home version because they were just solid well-made games that were a blast to play. I never really had a favorite turtle that I'd always pick when playing the game. I'd just choose which one to fight based on which weapon they had instead of their personality. For me, this is definitely one of the better arcade to home translations and Konami did a great job of keeping the feel of the game while actually adding new content. Number 3, Game Ground on the Sega Genesis. Game Ground was one of those arcade games that I rarely saw, but when I did come across it, I would definitely play it. That's right, I played it and I loved it even though it was made by Sega. When I owned a Genesis before my Super NES, this was one of my favorite games. 
The conversion from the arcade is very good. The graphics suffer a little bit, and the game does run slower, but it's all there. And believe it or not, it actually has more levels than the arcade. The game is played on a single screen. Your goal is to reach the exit with all of your fighters or kill every enemy on the playfield before time runs out. You have three characters to choose from at the start of the game. Each one is different in terms of firepower. They can all shoot in eight directions with their primary weapon. The secondary weapon of each character varies in what it does. Some can reach higher ledges and some can shoot across the whole screen. On some levels, there will be other warriors to rescue. If you rescue one of them and bring them to the exit, they'll become playable in the following level. I think this is what I liked most about the game. I'm always trying to collect the different types of characters and figure out their attributes. It was kind of like Pokemon as I had to rescue them all. I needed to find out what each character was capable of so I'd know when to use them. Like the dwarf with his bow and arrow. He's fairly quick, his weapons have some decent range and he can shoot these guys off the roof. Then there's this guy who can sit at the back of the screen and shoot all the way across a level. His only problem is that he's super slow, so be careful. It's just a fun game in general and I think it has a great soundtrack as well. If you can get a friend to play with you, then you're in for a really good time because you're not only battling enemies, you're battling your friend to see who can pick up the extra soldiers. I've had a lot of really good memories with this one. Number 2, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Punch-Out was a decent dual-screen arcade game from Nintendo. I never really played it much because I wasn't much into boxing and it didn't really interest me. I'd watch a friend play more than I'd play myself and I enjoyed it for that. Of course, while watching somebody else play, you can see much more going on and notice more detail in the artwork. Like this, have you ever looked at the crowd in the arcade version? Yep, that's Donkey Kong back there. And look, is that Wario? Well, obviously it can't be, but it does kind of look like him. When the game was brought to the NES, I didn't buy it right away. But my brother-in-law did, and I'd play it from time to time when I was over at his house. I always hated how small little Mac was. His opponents were huge and he looked like a little kid fighting against him. I know why Nintendo made him that small, but it always seemed strange. Another thing that I didn't like at first was the fact that you can't move around the ring. You can dodge left and right, but you're stuck in one spot for the whole fight. As time went on, the game slowly grew on me and I ended up really having a lot of fun. I eventually did buy my own copy and played the hell out of it. I really enjoyed figuring out my opponent's telltale signs of when they were going to attack. Like look at Great Tiger here. Watch the jewel in his turban, it'll flash when he's about to throw a punch. How in the hell that jewel knows how to do this is beyond me, but you know what, I'm glad it does. And when Bald Bold charges, I still have a hard time knowing exactly when to punch. But after a couple of knockdowns, I get him back. As with a lot of Nintendo games at the time, the music is short and repeats a lot, but the melodies are great and stick with you forever. It goes through so many emotions in just one match from the urgency to get up after being knocked down, to feeling victorious when you knock down your opponent. This soundtrack simply couldn't be better fitted to this game. Truly one of my favorite games on the NES and one that I've actually never beaten. Yep, I've never beaten Mike Tyson and I'm not ashamed to admit it. But he's not going anywhere, so I have time to work on it. Number 1! Gun Smoke on the Nintendo Entertainment System I was a big fan of Gunsmoke by Capcom in the arcade. I always loved playing it at least once or twice each time I saw it. I didn't put a lot of money into it because it was so damn hard. I just never felt that I'd be able to beat it unless I put at least 5 bucks in it and that was not going to happen since I never had that much money anyways. When I bought the home version of Gunsmoke, I was beyond happy. Sure, the game isn't an exact port of the arcade. It's missing a few levels and bosses, but overall it was what I wanted. It had some nice graphics and a really good Capcom soundtrack. In fact, I like the music a lot more than the arcade version. In the home port, your score is the amount of money you have. You can buy weapons, a wanted poster, and even a horse from the townspeople. You need to find a hidden wanted poster in each level to fight the boss. And if you can't find it, just buy it from the townspeople. 
I'd always laugh when someone would tell me, We are on your side! And then proceed to charge me big money to buy a weapon. Yeah, you're on my side for a price. I used to play the game using the standard controller and I thought it was just as hard as the arcade game. Controlling your cowboy was fine, it was just shooting the guns that was hard. To shoot left you hit the B button. To shoot right you hit the A button. And to shoot straight forward you hit both buttons at the same time. I just couldn't mash those buttons fast enough for the amount of enemies that were coming at me. So needless to say, I died a lot. At some point in my youth, I bought an NES Advantage controller. Holy crap they named that controller right because it gave me a huge advantage. With turbo controls for the A and B buttons, this game became much easier. Holding down a button instead of mashing it is great. It didn't take long for me to finally beat the game. I still love playing through this game and playing it for this review was really fun and brought back some great memories. Alright Dave, that was an interesting list. I think mine's a little better. <laughs> well, but... of course you do, because, you know, your games are different from mine. Yes, but, yes. Uh, I don't know, can you believe I can't beat, or <laughs> not can't, but haven't beat Mike Tyson? No, I think, I think you can't beat him. I can beat him. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I wanted to. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think you can. I don't think you've given it enough effort. Well, it's hard because, you know, he hits you once and you're down, and after a few rounds of that, you kind of like, eh. Well, what you need to do is use the level select code and practice on them, and then you can You're do right. Them. Yeah, so, put the code anyway, directly to them. My turn. Here's my top five. Number five, Choplifter on the Sega Master System. Choplifter was originally a decent computer game. This here is the SG-1000 version running on my Master System, and it looks very similar, but it's hard as hell. The SG-1000 was Sega's system that appeared before the Master System, by the way. Well, Sega ported Choplifter to the arcade and made it like 800 times better in the process. Your goal is to rescue at least 20 of the hostages that are being kept behind enemy lines. You want to keep your hostages alive because if more than 12 of them die, you lose a life. I like the primitive little voices in the arcade. So cute. It was a tough game for sure, but still more manageable than the previous versions that I played. Fortunately, the Master System port is based on the arcade, not the computer version. In this one, you need to rescue 40 or more hostages per level as there are twice as many of them per stage. Somehow it ends up being a lot easier than the arcade, but it's still no slouch. The cave level is super tough as it's actually the enemy hideout. And of course, who doesn't love getting blown away while you're back at your base unloading the hostages which are now all dead? Hello, this is a demilitarized zone, thank you. But you eventually get past it and move on to level 4. This one is the only level that resembles the original version of Choplifter with the twinkling stars, moon, and all that stuff. After that, the game just loops over and over forever until you lose all of your lives or manage to get 24 or more hostages killed in a single level. All in all, I've got to say that this is the best version of Choplifter anywhere and it's by far the most controllable, even if it does give you a little bit of trouble at first. It plays more like an arcade game than a computer game and I can definitely appreciate that. The music is going to drive the other people in the house nuts though, but you know what? That's their problem. Number 4, R-Type on the TurboGrafx-16. R-Type is a cool arcade game that, at the time, was quite different than most other shooters out there. You had a detachable droid module which added extra firepower and strategy. You had a few different weapons to choose from, lots of cool looking monsters, and everything wasn't quite as boring looking as most other shooters of the time which lacked a lot of inspiration in the art style. It was first ported home to the Sega Master System, and for what it was, it was an awesome port. Sure, there was lots of flicker and it did run kinda slow, but it had a special bonus stage that no other version to this day ever had, and the music in it is awesome.
but my favorite port is on the TurboGrafx-16. The graphics are almost identical to the arcade, with a few exceptions. The screen now scrolls up and down a bit to compensate for the lower resolution. Also, there is still a ton of flicker. Insane amounts, actually. But I still enjoy the hell out of it. One feature that is way better than the arcade version is the music. The arcade sounds abrasive and metallic, whereas the turbo version here sounds warm and fuzzy. And who doesn't love that fuzzy TurboGrafx-16 sound? And it's for this reason alone that I enjoy this version more than the arcade perfect ports that showed up on later systems. The game itself is methodical and it's the kind of game that makes you want to keep trying again and again. You need to learn how to strategically use your droid to protect yourself and defeat enemies. In Japan, there's also R-Type Complete CD for the PC Engine Super CD, and it'll play fine on your US Turbo Duo or TurboGrafx-16 with a Super System card. This is basically just a Turbo version on a disc with some average looking cutscenes between every other level and strange new music. The music has its charms, but overall I think I like the Hue card music better. This one sounds like I'm in a club and it doesn't really fit the game. It does have unlimited continues though, so check out our type on the TurboGrafx-16 if you have one. Number 3. Ghouls and Ghosts for the Sega Genesis Ghouls and Ghosts was the arcade sequel to Ghosts and Goblins and it was amazing. I only ever saw an arcade unit in the local game store in Inglewood, Colorado, and that was before the Genesis had launched in the US. I'd heard that it was coming to the Genesis and it was billed as one of the must-have games. Now while the Genesis version isn't a perfect port graphically by any means, it's close enough. In fact, this game was the one that made most magazine editors change their tune about how they viewed the system compared to the also upcoming TurboGrafx-16. The gameplay is superb, and the Genesis version was programmed by none other than Yuji Naka. Yes indeed, the very same Yuji Naka behind the glorious, celebrated, unforgettable, and stunning Super Thunderblade. The first thing you want to do is go into the options screen and change the difficulty to professional, otherwise the game is just far too easy. It's still pretty easy on professional though, but then again I've been playing this very copy that you're watching right here for over 25 years. I mean check out my high scores, wow! One thing that I've always loved about this game is that you can shoot up and down. Future games took that away and that always left me disappointed as it's fun to shoot up and down. Why the hell would you take that away? I love how the stages all have unique designs in the beginning and the second half of the stage, and the bosses even all have their own music. And yes, once you defeat the final stage, you get a message telling you that all your work isn't good enough and that you've got to do it all again, but with a special weapon this time. Most people hate this, but with this game, it's pretty cool. You can just plow through it with a new weapon once you get it. Well, this boss is a bit tougher due to the reach of the weapon, but you can do it. Fortunately for everyone, Yuji Naka decided to allow diagonal so Arthur doesn't come to a grinding halt if they're accidentally pressed but you can turn that feature off if you really want to. So can I 1cc this game? Absolutely not. And that's because I'd rather die than collect a lot of these weapons, and it happens often. On the first run through, I always go for the dagger and I don't get anything else. I don't want anything else. I'd rather replay an entire level than give up that weapon. On the second run through, it's not wise to lose the special weapon. You can always get it back, but that kind of seems to be a chore, so I just keep it. Ghouls and Ghosts is by far the best game in the series, and this is the version that I enjoy playing the most, by far. Number 2, Outrun on the Japanese Sega Saturn. OutRun is one of the best arcade games of all time. It's a fantastic driving game with some fantastic music and some fantastic scenery and it's a true classic in every sense of the word. It's fantastic. And it's had its share of ports. The Master System version is pretty fun in its own unique way. The Genesis got a port featuring a fourth musical track and some darker graphics. There's even a somewhat decent version for the PC Engine which was only released in Japan. But the Saturn port is absolutely, you guessed it, fantastic. Released in the US by Working Designs in the Sega Ages collection, it's a one-to-one -one port of the arcade. Everything is here and you can choose the Japanese track layout or the overseas version. I've always preferred the overseas layout myself. But there's more! 
By holding buttons A and C at the same time when selecting the track layout, you can select smooth mode. That enables the game to run at 60 frames per second, which is twice as fast as the arcade machine. So now you've got arcade perfect graphics, arcade perfect music, and superior to the arcade frame rate. Now it's even more like the arcade than the arcade is, if that makes sense. However, I've got to admit that the 60 frames per second mode kind of does take a bit of getting used to. The game almost seems like it's running slower, even though it's not. The normal mode is actually 60 frames per second as well. It's just that the road updates one frame, everything else the next, then the road, then everything else again. The smooth mode here updates everything in perfect synchronization every single frame as you can see as I step through it. It's different, but it's awesome. But wait, there's even more! The Japanese version of OutRun comes on its own disc and you can choose between arcade and arranged music. This is all sorts of awesome. The music was arranged by Hiroshi Kawaguchi who's the original composer and he did an amazing job. These tracks were left out of the US version because they put Space Harrier as well as Afterburner on the same disc so there wasn't any room for the extra audio. Regardless, this is absolutely the definitive version of the original OutRun. It's like the Special Extended Director's Digitally Remastered Turbo Final Cut Edition. It can even be used with the Saturn steering wheel, which probably makes it even more authentic, but I haven't had a chance to get one yet. So pick this up and make sure your Saturn can play Japanese games. Now I've heard that there may be some compatibility issues with this game in Model 2 Saturns. Model 2s are the ones with round buttons, and the Model 1 has oval buttons. I recorded the game footage for this review using a Model 2 and had no issues, but your mileage may vary. Number 1 Super Monkey Ball for the Nintendo GameCube Unfortunately, I've never seen a Monkey Ball arcade machine in real life. It ran on Naomi Hardware, which is basically a Dreamcast with more memory, and this was a disc-based game. And your only objective is to roll that damn monkey through the goal. Well, you can collect bananas too if you want. So very simple, yet so very fun. When the Nintendo GameCube launched in 2001, Super Monkey Ball was right there beside it. And this indeed is quite the super version. All of the stages from the arcade version are here, but they changed the colors, textures, and the backgrounds. They also improved the music tenfold and changed the original robotic voice to a new human announcer, and he sounds maybe a little too happy to be there. Ready? You have beginner, advanced, and expert levels. They're all full of fantastic level design that'll make you want to try again and again until you master it. Get past all of these levels without continuing and you get to play the extra levels. These are mostly pretty easy, but still lots of fun. Beat those without continuing on the expert level and now you're at the master levels. The arcade only had one master level, but the GameCube version has 10. Even I've got to say that these are not easy. But you still want to keep trying again and again until you do it. The controls simply could not be better in this game, and the GameCube analog stick is perfect for it. Don't even bother trying to play it with any different type of analog stick, nothing comes close. The camera can sometimes be bothersome, and there's not much you can do about it, but to be honest, it kind of seems intentional. Maybe I'm making up excuses, I don't know. Anyway, if you play the expert mode and manage to get to the extra and master levels, that's 70 different levels right there. And most of these levels are different than those that appear in the beginner and the advanced mode, so you've got over 100 different levels to play and master. Great graphics and fun music round things out. Oh, and I almost forgot. They added a crap ton of mini games. You've got monkey racing, monkey golf, monkey billiards, monkey bowling, monkey fighting, and monkey target. These are all really fun, but Monkey Target has got to be the best. Try to land and get the most points using the best modifiers. The music here is incredible and you can spend hours just playing this. Leave it to Sega to pack so much awesome into a tiny disc. Ready? Alright Joe, pretty good. Pretty good top five for you, I Absolutely. see. Of course, 
you know, I don't agree with it completely, but you do have awesome games in there. You don't like Super Monkey Ball? I do like Super Monkey Ball, and I love love Ghouls and Ghosts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like I say, I agree with you, them. But... You like how I can just, like, walk through Ghouls and Ghosts? <laughs> I do like that. 45 minutes? Yes. So, Two times. It's, it really is an yeah. easy game. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, well, like I said, I've, I've been playing it for 25 years, so that yeah, probably makes it a little easier for yeah. me instead of someone who's just picking up the controller. Yeah. So, but don't give up if you try that game because it, it really is it worth really playing is through. It really is worth playing through. You're exactly right. And That's what right. are some of your favorite arcade to home conversions that I'd be interested in hearing? I don't mm -hmm. know if you would. Oh, I would but, too. Uh, of course. I love reading the comments about this. Uh, let us know and Dave will reply to your comments. I'll reply to a few. <laughs> no, <laughs> no right. I, I reply to comments too. And we'll catch you next time. What are you doing? Let's, let's go shoot the episode. Yeah, here. I know we got an episode to shoot, Joe. Just give, give me five minutes. I want to beat this game. Come on, man. Beat it later. We, let's just do this. Nah, nah, I can't. I, there's no save feature. I got to beat it now. Just, just come on. Mm. What are you doing? Joe! Stop! This is my Game Boy. You can't do this. That's mine. What are you doing? Oh. Stop it! Okay, I'll do the show. Stop! You're done with your game. Now let's do the show. You're going to have to do that. My mom and dad bought me this. They said if I broke it, they're not going to buy me another one, Joe. Oh my god, what am I going to do?